Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming back. This is part two of Annie's introduction to R and R Studio. Um, I think you've met Annie last week, and Ruth is co-hosting. And with that, I'm going to hand you straight over to Annie to get going. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, right. So everybody, welcome back. So. As usual, just as a reminder, this is being recorded and it's going to be uploaded on YouTube. I think, I think the link will be sent um, after the, the session is over. And I have Ruth with me today again, so she'll be monitoring the chat, helping me out with that. Um, right, so let's just get started. I'm going to stop my camera view because my monitor is behind my laptop. Uh, and I'll just start sharing my screen and oh yes before that i'm just going to send a link to the nhs intro um positive cloud workspace again because uh, it is the same one uh, that we used last time so i'm just going to send that link again just in case you need it Just click on that link to access the same workspace that we were working at yesterday. You should see your intro to our, our studio project once you're in that workspace. So you don't need to click on Zoe's one anymore. You can just click on the one that you were working on last week. It should have been kept there. If not, then just clone a new one from Zoe's. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing the screen. Right. Uh, if people don't see my screen, please let me know. If not, I will continue from where we left off. And as a reminder, we will be having a break in the middle of these, <clears throat> these three hours. So I think we'll take a break at 11 o'clock uh, and then hopefully finish at 1230 or earlier. So that's the plan today. All right, so if you just click on the project that you were working on last week, and then it should open within a few seconds, like so. <clears throat> yeah, and at the bottom of your console, I should say session restored from your saved work from last week. So this is our script um, that we're working on last week with the ggplot. So you can either continue your work this week in the same script, or you can choose to open up a new script. Um, you could name it something else, maybe data wrangling, because today we're going to be more focused on data wrangling, which is another term for data cleaning. <clears throat> so it's kind of the pre-processing stage and the analytical and kind of data exploration stage. Um, of your analytical workflow in R. So this is where you're kind of cleaning your data, you're kind of looking through it, you're kind of exploring your research questions, filtering things, um, sorting things, like arranging things by a certain column, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I, that's what I mean when I say data wrangling. And R is particularly a great tool for, for that. Um, using the dplyr package, which is what will, I think the bulk of the session is going to be spent focused on a dplyr and functions within the dplyr package. As a reminder, dplyr is included tidyverse, so we've installed all the tidyverse packages in advance, so you do have access to this package, no need to install anything new. So as a start, um, in my new script, I'm just going to title it Data wrangling, again, if you want, you could use the script that you were working on previously. A tip for organization in scripts, if you want to add in a new section to your script, you can use uh, control shift, oh, not that, what was it, control shift R, yes. If you press control shift R on your keyboard, you can add in a new section in your script. 
and that will just add in this kind of long trailing uh, kind of um, comment that will allow you to kind of separate aspects of your script. And then you can kind of see each section. If you click on like this icon here, you'll see that a new kind of heading has appeared called data wrangling. So if you had a heading at the top here, again, control shift R, I'm just going to call this CG plot, for example. If I add in that heading, you'll see that it appears here, kind of like a uh, table of contents that's accessible. If you click on this tiny little button here, uh, you'll be able to kind of skip to sections of your script if it is a long script, you know, which does tend to happen when you're working with R a lot. You can also add, um, yeah, you can add this to your new script or to your existing script. It doesn't matter. And I think you can also access the headings. You click on this section here. Yeah, you'll also be skipped to parts of your script. So that is just a tip. Um, from my experience, it makes things a little bit easier when you're uh, coding a lot. So you can either do that from your previous script, or you can just make a new script. Actually, I think that... Uh, yeah, I'll probably just create a new script, but you can decide whichever one you prefer, if you prefer it all in one script. Okay, so let's just start by librarying in the dplyr package. So as a reminder, library just loads the package. It doesn't install it. So this is just kind of telling R that you want to use it now. And just run any line of code by the control enter shortcut and it will run the, the piece of code that is on your current line selected by your cursor. Or you can select it and click on the run button, whichever one you prefer. Cool, so let's get back to the slides. Again, if you have any questions, either type it in the chat and Ruth can address it, or you could just interrupt me in the middle. I really don't mind being interrupted at all. It is quite an informal session. Cool, so wrangling. Wrangling refers to reshaping or transforming data into a format which is easier to work with so that you can later do visualizations, plotting, modeling, computing of statistics, that kind of thing. It's kind of the first or the second step. Um, as an analyst, you know, your first step might be to like actually get the data and then get into a format where you can actually read it in R, but I would say the second step is definitely like exploration and wrangling. So we are going to do that today. Tidy worst functions work best with tidy data. Each variable forms a column and each observation forms a row. You can kind of see that in your RStudio environment, it will refer to observations and variables, rows and columns. And broadly, this means uh, that, you know, uh, there's long rather than wide tables, because I guess a long table is a little bit more readable than a really wide table with several columns. but you know, those data sets do still exist. You can then flip them around or you can kind of work with it if you, uh, if there's a use case, a specific use case for this type of uh, data structure. But generally we prefer long rather than wide. So the dplyr package, um, it is a language for data manipulation. Most of the time you can solve all of your data regular needs with just five dplyr verbs or five functions, verbs and functions kind of used interchangeably. I will be using these five functions in this slide kit. So let's say you have another project to work on today. You will be exploring the mental health inpatient capacity for a specific hospital or in England. Um, to do this, we'll be looking at the changes in the number of occupancy of mental health beds available. So given a data set that already has this, the background being that, you know, the clinical effectiveness and safety when a ward is fully occupied is a serious challenge. So there's a uh, cost associated with uh, out of area placements and also mean patients are separated from their social support networks. So obviously a good research question for us. Um, 
The data includes KH03 returns, so bit numbers and occupancy by organization published by NHS England. It is fully free to download online from the uh, NHS England statistics website here. If you want to try downloading it, you can, but it's already downloaded for you. So this is just to let you know where you can get it. And I think this data has actually been partially cleaned from that link. So there's been some additional cleaning done. So the format that we are getting is actually cleaner than what you'll be getting from NHS England, the raw download. Right, so yeah, you can start a new script by either pressing the control shift N shortcut, or you can just click on the button like I did. And we can then load the data called bets underscore data dot CSV. So let's do that now. I think we covered let me just move this tab over. I think we covered importing data last week and we agreed that it's best to have the import data code within the script itself instead of relying on the wizard. So this is the data set we're working with. I do like the import data set option for when you want to get a view of the data set. In this case, when you do get this quick view of the data set, you can see that the data isn't very clean. You can see that, and this is very common with Excel files, there will be some kind of metadata at the very top rows. And while you're loading this data in, you really want to skip these two top rows. So you can see that the column names actually start from one, two, three, row three. So these are probably the column names. And then you've got some leftover columns here. I'm not sure where they are. Um, uh, it should be beds average, and occupancy average. But the data set is kind of not, okay, hold on. All right, so I think data set we have does not really match the slides. These two columns should have a name. Um, we can still work with that. We can do some extra cleaning. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry about that. We can do ex some extra cleaning just to add those uh, column names, I think. So in the wizard, how you do this, you would probably skip to skip the first two rows. Skip this first three. Yep. Oh, and then the column names actually show up. I don't know why it wasn't showing up in the preview before. But if you do the skip three, like I did, then all the column names will look much cleaner. Yeah. And then some additional things that you want to just do while you're importing your data set is just to check that the column formats are correct. So for example, the date is shown that it's a character. You kind of want it formatted as a date format. The organizational code seems fine. That should be a character. That seems fine. Bet's average is a double, which means that it's numeric. It's counted as numerical values. That seems fine as well. Occupational average is also double, so that's good. The only thing I would change here is to change the date column into a date format. So we can do, yeah, so these slides just go through kind of what I went through. Yeah. So what you can do as this shows is you can click on the column and then select from the drop down menu, select date, and then you can enter the format string. So let me do that and show you what the format string is like. So format string, everything kind of follows the uh, percentage sign. So M is going to be small format or short form month. D stands for short form date and Y stands for uh, full year. If you do, for example, small case Y, then that'll be just like um, 13 instead of 2013, for example. So we do want to keep the capital Y. Typically, when you're working in R, you want the format to be uh, a format in which case you can kind of sort it numerically. So that means year first, uh, and then month, and then day, because that way you can kind of sort it by either ascending or descending order. So what we want is Y first, month second, and then date third. And we also would not want these slashes. Uh, we want them to be hyphens. Let me just double check that that is correct. 
Yeah. So you want your date sorted in this kind of format. You want it to be year hyphen month hyphen day. And obviously you want the, the month and the day to be um, worth uh, two digits instead of one. So I think if you click on OK here, it will just generate some code here. And then, oh, something went wrong. Year, month. Day. Maybe I did something wrong here. Let me see what the slides say. Um, when I put oh. the switches in, it came up on the date as just the hyphens in between. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Let me change that. So I think... Oh, I see. I see. I see. Hold on, let me read you this whole thing. Okay, skip three. Day, okay. So sorry, in the, here, you're supposed to make sure that the format matches what you see and then R will transform it into the format that we want. So you actually don't want to edit this. You, I mean, you want to edit this so that it matches what you see. So just to make sure that it matches, we already have month and then day and then year. So that's correct. And we click OK, and then R will automatically change it into that ideal format that I just spoke of. Yeah. So thank you for reminding me of that. That's what went wrong there. OK. So now you can import the data set, or as we agree, we can just copy this code and put it into our script library in read r because that is the package that contains read underscore csv and then if you run this it should import the best data set into the format that uh, we want so now you can see that this data set is quite clean and the date is formatted properly so now you can kind of sort the date properly and when you look at this uh, the uh, structure of the data set you'll also see that it's formatted properly we don't need to do that right now because I think that uh, we trust that it's done the right thing. Okay, let's see. What's next? So the data set should look like this. Uh, the last two columns do have some NAs. There's always going to be some missing data. That's perfectly fine. All right, any questions before we move on to the dplyr verbs? No, all right, we'll just crack on then. All right, so the verbs are as follows. Arrange, filter, mutate, group by, and summarize. Just from these words, we can kind of deduce what they're going to do. So arrange is gonna sort, filter is gonna filter, mutate, mutate just means that you're gonna make a new column essentially. Group by, pretty straightforward, and summarize also pretty straightforward. So these verbs aren't used independently of each other. Each is a separate step in the code, kind of like, so um, here we kind of use the example of making mashed potatoes. So you'll start with a potato and then you would peel it and then you would slice it and then you would boil it for 25 minutes. So there are specific instructions and then you would mash it. So in the same way, we can use the dplyr verbs. If you think of the potato as kind of a data set with subsequent steps as the verbs, you know, the peel would be the function, slice would be the function, size equals medium would be the argument, boil has a time argument that you can input 25, and then your output is the mashed potato. So with that example in mind, we're going to deal with our data set kind of in a similar way to how we make mashed potato, very fun. Um, and then you might have noticed actually from um, last week when we were working with ggplot that there was this plus operator that we were using. So dplyr verbs also, um, I wouldn't say it's a similar operator, but they kind of uh, logically work the same way in that it kind of just tells the dplyr verb that there's a step following after it. So just like don't, uh, it basically tells the dplyr verb that we're not done with the operation yet. We still want to peel, we still want to slice, and we still want to boil. So this kind of percentage 
bigger than percentage uh, combination together is an operator, so it's called an operator. Um, this operator is actually from a different package within the tidyverse package called Magritar, Magritar. But when you load in tidyverse and dplyr, I think it will automatically load it in, so you don't need to worry about loading in an extra package called that. Um, but just so you know that this is from a different package, so if you get into specific issues with your R not recognizing the pipe operator, that is why. So you might want to load in the entire tidyverse if that happens. Um, yeah, so this operator essentially is quite unique just to tidyverse uh, functions. And it just says, don't stop yet. There's another step following. The tidyverse syntax is pretty uh, easy to understand. In my opinion, it's very beginner friendly. Um, so essentially we're saying that there's a data frame and then we do something with specific rules and then we do another thing with specific rules. And the output is a new data frame, which is a cleaner data frame or a data frame that contains like a new column with like a new like proportion value or a new mean value or something like that. And we can combine simple pieces to solve complex puzzles by doing this. So using dplyr, we're going to start coding now. Let's answer the question of which organization provided the highest number of mental health beds. So as you can imagine, if you want to figure out which organization specifically has provided like the highest value of something, you'll want to kind of instinctively, you'll want to sort your data set by a column, right? So to sort, we will use the arrange verb, um, which is quite easy. So arrange and then the name of the column name that you want to arrange by. We can do this now. Let's take the beds data set because the first argument should always be your data set as we remember from ggplot. And then we use the arrange verb to say that we want to sort by uh, average beds. Beds average. And if we run that, so as a reminder, either control enter or you can click on the run button on your console, you should be able to see the results. Um, so we can see that if we sort it, it's successfully sorted by beds average, but by kind of um, uh, descending order. Actually, I think that's yeah. Oh, and also, uh, if you had to type this out, sorry, it's kind of by habit that I didn't mention this, but there's a shortcut for the pipe operator, control ship M. That is the easiest and quickest way to add in the pipe operator instead of just typing it out. It's a bit of a hassle. I'm not quite sure why they designed it that way. Um, but the shortcut control ship M is very useful and I use it all the time. It's, it's by habit now. So beds data, pipe operator, arrange, beds average. You can see that it's successfully sorted it, but kind of not in the order that we want. So we kind of want it in descending order where the, um, you know, the highest number is at the top. So there's also a helper function that we can use called DESC, this short for descending. And then we'll just add that in, make sure that you have your parentheses, uh, make sure that you have two parentheses now one after arrange and one after descending. And if you run that, now the uh, highest number appears at the top and you can see that with relation to average beds, Nottinghamshire Healthcare had the highest. Yep, so this is the result that we got at first. And then we added the descending function and we got the same result. So that checks out. Cool. And also just a note uh, at the very bottom here, descending works for text and numeric variables. So it can also um, 
and a range in general can work for, you know, sorting by alphabetical order and by numerical order. And also date, you can sort it by date. So it's kind of the same way that it works with numerical variables. You know, you can sort it by recency. So it's quite useful. Any questions about a range and how to use it? I'm getting a, a, an error. Is it because I haven't done something? Okay, what error is that? Um, it says object beds have not found. Object beds not found. Um, so you got beds underscore AV and it doesn't recognize it? No. Okay. Can I double check that your code matches what's on the screen? Um, I haven't got the descending in, but it wasn't working before that. Let me just try again. Yes. Yeah, and then okay. Do you want to share your screen, and we can kind of debug it? Okay. Oh, it says I can't while you're sharing. Oh, let me stop sharing. How about now? Is that showing? Uh, do you have the code for reading the data in? I don't know. Okay. So if you click on the beds, on, oh, actually, I mean, you've read the data in. Um, I can see that. Do you have, okay, so you got library D player in. Can I see your data set? If you click on beds underscore data in your environment tab. So that should be on the top right. If you click on beds data. And this one. Oh. Yes. Okay. So I think it's because you skipped the step where you're, um, skipping the first three rows. Oh, right, so, okay. Yeah, so what I can do is I'm going to copy and paste the piece of code uh, into the chat. And if you paste that before you do the arrange, I think that will solve the problem. Yeah, and then if you have your arrange after that piece of code. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I would just erase the duplicate code on line 39 so that when you're um, rerunning the whole script, it won't error in the middle of it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Cool, let's move on. Um, yes, and again, if my audio starts getting buggy, please someone interrupt me. Maybe Ruth can interrupt me and uh, let me know because my mic's been really weird lately, but hopefully, hopefully that's not the case right now. Okay. So our range was pretty easy to use. Um, so we can move on to the next one. So next research question, which two organizations provided the highest number of mental health beds in September 2018 specifically? So now we are kind of interested in a specific date. And, you know, we're kind of asking the same questions like highest number of beds. But now we want specific to one particular month. So to do that, we'll use a range as before, because again, we want the highest number of something, but we also want to filter it to September 2018. And this is very common in like, I think most of our jobs, right? We want to know for like a specific quarter, specific month, specific time period, what is going on for, you know, a specific variable. Right. So as I mentioned, we'll be using the filter verb for this job. It's quite... Uh, intuitive, the, the name of this verb. 
So filter what that does internally. Uh, it's a kind of a test for true and false. So test for logicals. So one of the way one of the ways where you can test for a logical is using the equals equals. Um, so equals equals is different from single equals. A single equals in R usually means that you're assigning something to it. And I think we'll get to this in the next slide deck. But if you do the double equal sign, it means that you're kind of testing for equality. <clears throat> Sorry. So yes, so um, in order to filter to the date, you will need to use the double equal sign. So what you're gonna do is you're going to open up the uh, parentheses after the, the filter verb. And then you're going to say from the date column, you want to test the equality of date being uh, December 2018, specifically, I guess, like the first of December 2018. I think, let me just double check this. I think for this data set, it's just the first of every month. Yeah, it's just the first of every month. So in this case, we're just going to use the first of December. Okay. The expression inside the brackets should return true or false. That's what I mentioned before. True or false is what is called a logical format of, uh, yeah, it's a logical format. So you have your characters, you have your numericals, and you have your logicals, and you have your dates. There might be some other formats that I'm forgetting, but those are the ones that are used the most, I would say. So you want this whole statement within the filter verb to either be true or false. Okay, and when it's true, then filter will keep those that are true, those that are false, the filter will kind of filter out, which makes sense. So what it's going to do is anything that meets this criteria within filter is going to be kept. So only the trues. If you want to do the opposite where you want to exclude and test with expression is not equal, then it's quite simple. It's just um, exclamation mark equals. This means that you're testing for anything that is not December 2018. So let's let's try it out. Let's try to filter to specifically September 18. Uh, sorry, <laughs> September in 2018. Yeah. So I would say you know make some room. Um, don't override your your existing code and do. Fed's data again, followed by the pop pipe operator, control shift M. This time you're going to filter, go to filter, and then you want the date, the double equal sign, uh, 2018 09 01. Let me just check that's correct. 2018, yeah. So it should be month and then. I don't think this is formatted correctly. Let me just double check one thing. Sorry. We need to make sure that the date is formatted correctly. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that was why I was confused because it didn't look right. Okay. Sorry, guys. So with the code that you pasted in before, can you please change it to E and then M? Let me try that and see if that looks correct. Okay, that looks much better. 2018-91. Okay, yes. Yes, very sorry, guys. I'm going to paste in this code so that you don't have to kind of review it again. So this is the code that we just got from the wizard, but you can also kind of type it out from scratch as well. Just make sure the format for the call date is DMY. Yeah, I, I like I didn't look at it um, close enough when I did that. So I didn't realize that it, it should be it was doing the, the date first and then the month second. Sorry about that, but hopefully a quick fix. Um, so after you fix that and please rerun it as well. Don't forget to rerun it because unless you rerun it, you'll be stuck with the old version of the beds data. So please rerun this. Um, after that, if you do the filtering for date 2018-901 and then continue the arrange. So it should be the same as what we did before, that's average. Right, 
and then run this. Get some space. Okay. Okay, now we see that everything that is returned is for September 2018. The date is the same, and we've successfully sorted by uh, beds again. And we've got the top two organizations, East London, Nottinghamshire Healthcare. So that kind of solves our research question. And I'm also going to add in a comment. So this is for a range, and this is for a filter, just so I can make it look neat and tidy. Right. Also, I advise you guys to periodically save your script so that in case your computer crashes or anything like that, um, you don't lose all of your work. So you can either click on the floppy disk icon or control S shortcut, which is what I like to do every once in a while, just to make sure that my work doesn't get lost. Okay, so let's see the slides, if it follows what we've done. Um, so the slides kind of arrange at first, but I think either way will give you the same result. Um, I just like to filter it first and then arrange it because it, I think like the steps make more sense if you do the filtering first, but whichever, whichever way that you decide to do it, you should be able to get the same result. Yeah. Any questions about using filter? Is there one that's more efficient in terms of ordering a range and filter? Uh, more efficient in what way? In terms of like, if it filters the data first, then arranges it, I can imagine that that would cut down the data it's looking at, so then it would be less computationally heavy to do the arrange on it. Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, so... I guess in this case, you don't really see a difference because the data set is kind of small. Mm -hmm. But if you are working with a very large data, like big, proper big data, then definitely filter first okay. and then do your other computations. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to our third research question, which five organizations have the highest percentage bed occupancy in, again, September 2018? So now we are kind of talking about a new measure. There's a mention of percentage and we don't have percentage. So what we're gonna do is, again, we use a range because again, it's asking for the highest of something. We'll use filter because it mentions the same month, but now we don't have the percentage variable. So we're gonna derive it from the existing variables, right? We're gonna create a new variable. And to do this, we're going to use the mutate verb. So mutate, kind of an odd name for this, um, but it does, you know, the, the meaning should fit anyway. Basically, you're going to make a new variable from existing ones. You're going to mutate. Um, so it, again, the syntax is very simple. All D player verbs kind of have very simple, easy to understand syntax. What you're going to do is you're going to give the name of the new variable that you're going to create. And then you're going to use the assignment operator, which is a single equal sign, not double. And then you're going to say that the percentage is going to be derived from the, uh, the occupancy divided by the beds. And those are the existing variables that we have, as you might remember from when we looked at the data set. Uh, yes, and then we're, we're calling it uh, percent occupancy, um, you know, the the brief version of what I just said. So like I said, the equal sign is not a test of equality, it's just an assignment. And I will just add to that by saying that when you're doing this sign from uh, when we were importing the data set, it's actually basically the equals. So if you actually run this as well, it will do the exact same thing. But I think it's kind of, um, the R, uh, the R etiquette is kind of just to do this assignment operator when you're assigning a new, uh, when you're assigning to a new data set or a new list or a vector, you kind of like to use the assignment operator so that you can kind of differentiate from when you're using the equal sign to uh, use as assigning arguments and assigning within dplyr verbs, for example. 
But at the end of the day, if you use the equal sign here, it will do the same thing. So it's kind of up to you. Yeah. So yes, the equal sign is not a test of equality. And then this is this is the syntax we're going to do. We're going to add in the mutate as an additional step. So let's actually do this together. Mutate. Again, we're going to do spreads data. We're going to pipe control shift M. And then let's keep doing the filtering first so that um, uh, it makes more sense. Uh, this is what I tend to do as well, kind of like as a fourth habit, I tend to do the filtering first. And then I like to do the mutate second. The mutate, we're, we're, what we're calling it again, uh, percent occupancy, percent underscore OCC equals the beds, average divided by the uh, Occupational average, let me double check if that's correct. Oh, it's the reverse, all right. So it's occupancy first, divided by per, divided by beds. Yeah, and then pipe again, and then arrange by descending. And this time we want to arrange by the new variable that we just made. So we're gonna arrange it by percent occupancy. Okay, and if I run this in your console, you can see that at the very end, there's this new column called percent occupancy, the one we just made, and then successfully sorted it by descending orders. So we can see that those with 100% occupancy were Royal Free College, uh, Royal Free London, and Oxley's. But actually, I mean, the first one is kind of a given because they only have two beds, and they were both occupied, so... There is a little bit of a, you know, um, manual interpretation sometimes when it comes to these results. Um, so, you know, if I was doing my job, I would kind of eliminate Royal Free Lend just because they have very little beds for maybe for analysis criteria. But for the sake of this exercise, we successfully answered the research question. Let me go back to the slides and check that what we did was correct. Uh, yeah, we've done the filtering. They decided to do the mutate first. I guess that's okay as well. And then descending by percent occupancy. Yeah. Any questions about mutate? No? Okay. Let's move on. Question four, what was the mean number of beds across all trusts for each value of date? So this question is quite different from the other ones. It's asking now for the mean number of beds across all trusts for each date. So when I hear this, I'm like, we need to use group by. And it also mentions a summary statistic, a mean number of beds, which means that I would probably use a summarize. So for this exercise, we're going to try to use summarize. And then I think for the second step of this research question, we are going to use group by. For now, let's do the summarize step first. Um, summarize is a bit similar to mutate in that it will also create a new column, but it kind of uh, really cleans your data set afterwards. So it will make the new column and then it will kind of uh, dis, uh, throw away the other columns. So it will just, for example, if you were to run this code, means bed equals mean, you would only keep, be keeping the means bed. So it kind of makes a new column and then it dismisses the other ones, unless you specifically tell it to keep them. Um, so syntax is very similar to mutate, which we just learned. The name of your new column, assignment operator, and then how you're deriving the new variable is you're taking the mean of the bed's average. And mean is just a base R function. Um, you don't need to download anything to get the mean function. It's, there's, there's mean, there's also median. You know, these are examples of base R functions. So it's just free to use for now. Let's try it out. Okay, let's do the mute, let's do a summarize. And this syntax is quick. You're 
using the beds data and then you're doing the pipe operator control shift M uh, and then you're just doing summarize. And as a reminder, Dplyr will accept American versions of spellings as well. So it will also accept summarize with a set. Um, but yeah, you can use whichever one that, that you prefer. Um, and then within it, similar to mutate, um, I think our new call name is called means bed. Is it means bed? Means bed, yeah. Equals the mean of the beds average. And when we run this, what you're going to get is you're going to get a single row and it's just going to be NA. So something went wrong if you're getting only NAs, right? Um, but from here, we can see that summarize, uh, you know, has only kept the means bed, which is what we expect. So that's worked, but something's wrong with the data. So I think it's to do with this mean function. So what is happening here is that mean will not accept NAs. So if we were to look back on the beds data set, we can see that there are NAs existing in the beds average um, column, right? So we want to remove those. Well, we want to tell the mean function that we don't want to count the NAs. We want to exclude them when we're deriving the mean. So what we're going to do is within mean, there is another argument called na.remove. We're going to add in a comma and then na.remove equals true. All right. So that's just going to tell um, it that we don't want it to count the NAs. And then if we rerun that, then we'll see that we actually get a value, which is 300. So 300 is the, is the mean or the average of the entire column of uh, average, average number of beds. Okay, so that kind of answers the first part of the question. But I imagine that we'll be moving on to group by next. Right, and the slides also go through the fact that you get NA first, and then you have to add in NA remove equals true, and then you actually get this result. Okay, so summarize, I would say summarize is, uh, you might be wondering why you summarize when you can use mutate. Well, because actually, you know, you could just, instead of summarize, do mutate, and what it'll do is it'll actually return the entire data set alongside this means bed, but you can see that, you know, it's the same value. So you don't really need, you don't really need it to keep the entire data set. What summarize is really good for, in my opinion, is when you're kind of like at the end stage, your data set is all clean, it's all filtered, it's all arranged properly. And you just want like a few statistics left. You, maybe you want the mean, maybe you want the median, maybe you want the maximum, the minimum or something um, of like each organization's like occupancy numbers. So like at that point, you don't really care about getting the entire data set. You just care about seeing the stats in front of you and then like copy and pasting it into like a slide or something. So I would say that summarize is best used when you're kind of like at the end stage. And it's also, you know, the, the output is very clean. You know, you don't have to trough through the entire data set. You can just, you can just run this and you'll just get one number. You know, so it's like a very, very kind of end, end goal output. Okay, any questions about summarize? No, we're moving straight on then. So this is still question four because we haven't really answered the question. Now we know how to use summarize, but now we have to produce a summary value for each value of date. So we are grouping, we're gonna group by each, each date um, as I suspected. So you'll be using the group by verb, you'll be grouping by the date and then you'll be doing the summary. So group by is an amazing function. Uh, it is so, so useful. So I will take some time to explain group by in a little bit more detail. Um, so let's do beds data again, do the pipe, and then we can do the group by. 
and we're grouping by the date column. And then you do the pipe again, and I can just copy and paste this line of code from the previous exercise or the previous step. So essentially the same summarize code, you can just copy this. Um, and then if you run it, you can take a look at the output. So now I can see that for each unique date, you have a different value in the means beds, which is very useful if you think about real use cases, right? Like commonly we want to know some figure by day or some figure by geography, some figure by demographic group, you know, age group, ethnic group, something like that. So in those cases, you would use group by to group by the ethnic group or the age group or the geography. And then you would do the summarize and then you will get the value for every unique date, every unique age group, right? So as you can imagine, very, very useful, uh, very useful function for our line of work. And you can group by several columns. Uh, so you can group by date and let's see what else we can group by. We can group by date and organization as well. So that means that for every unique date, um, sorry, every unique organization by date, you can have a, uh, a unique figure. So we can do org name, comma, date. That just means that this just means that first you want to group by the organization and then you and then by organization you want to group by date as well. So this is probably going to return uh, a lot more rows, but you can see that now like in the in the summary view for the organization name together, there are unique dates. And then for each unique date in that organization, you're getting the mean bez. Obviously, if it were not such a summarized view, you would get, you know, in the later rows, you would get like the other organizations by date. So I think, I think that's uh, under understandable, All right? But for now, we can just go by date to keep things simple. And you should get this result again, you're, uh, you're summarizing. And then you can further like arrange this by descending order or something like that. But I think right now we don't. We don't really care about that. So does that make sense, what group I is doing? Could you please explain um, how, how group I changes when you have multiple uh, columns defined in it? Mm, yeah, so with organization name. Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this to like a temp file so that I could give you the full view, right? So when I do a group by, by two variables, like organization and then date, I open this up, you'll see that first it groups by organization and then it groups by uh, date. So for each unique date within the organization together, you're getting uh, a value. Like this is the average beds within this date for together and then by, uh, and then et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, you get through the other organizations like Fibro's Partnership, Ancient University Hospital, each of these, if it has a unique date, it will also have the means beds. Obviously for Ancient University Hospital, their data is always missing for some reason. So you're not really getting any means, but I think the, yeah, I think the, the logic follows. So this is going to be the full data set. It's quite long. But if this is, you know, if this is what your work uh, wants you to do, then this is what you would do. You would you would group by several things. You can group by like three columns as well. Um, just be mindful that, you know, at that point, your data set is going to be quite large. It all depends on what you're looking for in your research question. So, uh, so basically, it's like um, you you if you were splitting on data originally, if you, because we added another field, it will further split with like the date for each of whatever that variable is that you're adding in. So like um, it would give the date like here for every single organization. Um, it's yeah. a separate mean um, on each date. Yeah. So like a, okay, like an additional split basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, sorry about that. <laughs> thank you. No worries. No, that's a good way of thinking about it, like an additional split. Um, 
and the so if you imagine that you know if there were like different dates for each organization only the existing dates within the first variable would exist so for example if south tinside did not have data for um 2018 december it wouldn't group by that because it does not exist within the organization in the first place so it very much goes by the first variable which is the organization and then okay. within that organization, it will look for like, what are the unique dates within that organization? Okay. And then it will do the calculation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. It's a good question. Any other questions about group by? No, okay, let's, let's move on. And I'll also add, the fact that um, with group by, you can also do like the filtering, the mutating afterwards. So for example, if you want to group by like a geography and then you want to do the filtering and then you want to do the mutating specifically when it's in that group set, you can do that too. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that today because I think um, the important thing is just to understand what group by is doing because it is a very powerful uh, function. Right, so this slide kind of mentions something that I forgot to mention. Um, something must follow a group by because if you use group by alone, it does nothing, right? So let me just go back to this. If I were to not do the summarize after the group by and I ran this code, it would do nothing. It will return the data set as if nothing has happened, right? This is just the, the normal data set in its original state. But if you notice, if you're like, if you have a very keen eye, you'll notice that when you return the tibble, it will say groups date 21. What this means is that you have kind of transformed the tibble into a grouped tibble. And that grouped tibble is kind of uh, stored the metadata of the tibble now. So actually, if, sorry, I'm just gonna temporarily say this again. You don't need to do this. But if I then look at the class of this grouped tibble, it will say grouped df rather than just table df. Um, if I were to look at the class of like a non-grouped data set, so if I just looked at the class of bed data, I can't spell today. You can see that's very different. Spec table diff, I don't know what the spec stands for, maybe specific, but yeah, you can see that it doesn't mention group df at all. So the actual class has changed when you do the group by, and that means that Group by itself does nothing. All it does is tell the tibble that, right, we're going to group by a specific thing. Now, anything that follows or anything that is then done to this group data set is going to be by these groups. So we didn't really see any result by the group by until we did the summarize. And I'm going to paste this here. And I think this makes a lot of sense. This group by is just grouping it in the meta data, metadata. It, it doesn't like really, really do anything by itself. It's only after you start doing actions on top of it that you notice that it's doing the actions by the groups. And the way to interpret this groups uh, date 21, the, the number 21 is basically the number of unique uh, values within the variable that you group by. So in this case, it's noticed that there are 21 unique dates. So there are 21 unique groups in this table when you're grouping by it. Does that make sense? If I were to do, you know, the organization name again, and I run this, I check the group. It now says 4,558 because there are a lot of organizations and each organization has a lot of dates. So at that point, you have four, over 4,000 unique groups in that table. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the slide. Yeah, so the slide says that the change occurs behind the scenes, which is a much better way of explaining it rather than me uh, talking about the metadata and whatever. The change occurs behind the scenes. That's a good explanation. And then it goes through the uh, outputs that we just got when we did the group by date. So all this matches with our results, which is great. 
And of course, we have to mention ungroup. So as I just mentioned, when you do the group by, you are modifying the data set. You are modifying the class. The class itself has changed. When you're done with a group by uh, operation, you want to ungroup it just to be safe. Because whatever is done after you group by something, it is going to go by the groups. So if you kind of want to disable that effect, then you should do, again, the pipe and then the ungroup function. So if I run this, again, you'll notice that there's not really much of a difference in output, but you'll notice that the group by text is gone. Now it just says tibble 21 by, by two. Whereas if I didn't do the group by, it will, uh, actually it doesn't, it doesn't mention that after the summarize, that is interesting. Maybe the summarize kind of makes it ignore that. Um, but if, you know, if I were to run the group by here, it has this line about the groups. But if you ungroup it, so if I were to do the ungroup here, just so that I can kind of prove my point, if I were to do the ungroup here, that line is gone. Yeah. Okay, so it's always safe after a grouping operation to ungroup it. When you're done with the grouping, then you should ungroup it. Because I think if you if you work with a group data set for certain things, like I think certain like plotting packages, um, it will kind of do wonky stuff because a grouped, a, a grouped data frame works differently than a normal data frame. I think I mostly notice like errors with grouped data frames with uh, plotting. So I'll get some very weird plots because I think the plotting functions won't know what to do with a grouped data set. It's like, what, you know, like this is, this is strange. Uh, so yeah, especially when you're doing plotting, make sure that you're ungrouping first. Yeah, so as shown here, just add another pipe and then add in the ungroup. And you don't need to put anything within these parentheses. The ungroup verb in itself just does its thing by itself. It doesn't need any additional arguments. Right. Moving on to the final question. I think this is the final question. Uh, which five organizations have the highest mean bed occupancy? This looks very familiar. Is this an exercise over the five year period? Okay. I think this is an exercise. Let me just double check. Yes, I think this is the exercise. All right. So it's time to have some fun. Um, by yourself. So have a go on solving the fifth question on your own. As a reminder, you have all the five verbs at your disposal. So it mentions highest, which means you'll probably have to use a range. Uh, it mentions uh, a percentage bed occupancy, which means that you'll need to use the mutate to create a new variable. It mentions organization. So you'll probably uh, have to group by organization. And then it, uh, let's see, which five organizations have the highest mean bed occupancy? Uh, you can use summarize uh, instead of mutate, actually. So I think it depends on you, what, what you want. The mutate and summarize can sometimes be used interchangeably depending on how clean you want the output. So um, yeah, you, you, can, you can choose whichever one you like. And if you've been following in the previous four questions, um, doing this question on your own should be quite simple, actually. Just make sure that you follow each step. It's, it's all by logic, to be honest. Like, how are you going to answer this research question with the five verbs? So I would say uh, I'll give you guys 10 minutes to solve it, and then we can kind of review it, and then we'll go to the break, the 15-minute the break that I promised at the start. Uh, does that sound good? I'm just going to leave a slide. Uh, let me, sorry, let me just stop sharing my screen just for a second so that I could get this screen on. Uh, yes, I think there's a better slide to display. All right, cool. 
Just a second. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, I'm just gonna mute myself now so that I don't disturb you while you're working, but I'm gonna leave this slide on. It, it contains a hint for what you might want to do. And then we'll be back at 10.50 to review the results of this exercise and then we'll take a break, yeah? Can you make slide bigger, sorry? Yeah, will do.
Hi, uh, it's been 10 minutes. Does anybody need extra time or has everybody gotten to a place where they're confident? Or even if you're not confident, we'll be going through the answers. So everybody happy with that or do you want a few more minutes? I finished it. Finished? Awesome. Uh, all right, cool. In that case, let's continue on with the answers. So I'm just going to copy and paste this into, into my script. Which five organizations have the highest mean better? Can I see? Okay. Which five orgs have the highest? Percent bed occupancy. Highest mean mean percent bed occupancy. Okay. All right. So in the hand, it's got, you know, first you start with your data set and then you mutate so that you can get this bed occupancy or the percentage bed occupancy variable. Then you group by organizations and then you summarize uh to the mean and then you just arrange it so that you get the highest okay and i think you can you could play around with the order a little bit and you'll still get the same result but let's just kind of stick to what is most sensible so let's start with the beds data follow with the pipe operator again that's control shift m most important keyboard shortcut in my life and then uh we do the mutate so we want a uh, bed occupancy, which you could, I think it was called percent occupancy the first time we did it. And that was the occupancy, was it the occupancy first? Yeah, the occupancy average divided by the beds. That's average. Okay, and then pipe again. And this time we want to group by, so that you can get it by organization. So you could have done this either by org name or org code. I think they're both valid because each unique organization name we follow by a unique organizational code. So you could have done org name, you could have done org code. But I prefer to do org name because the organizational name just is more sensible when I see it rather than organizational code. By org name. Uh, and then we do the summarize. We do the summarize um, mean bed occupancy. So we'll just do mean beds. I think is what we called it the first time, followed by the mean function of the percent occupancy uh, variable that we just created in the mutate. And don't forget, don't forget about removing the NAs just in case that is a problem. Continue the pipe and we can do the final step, which is arranging so that we have the highest uh, means bed at the top. So you'll do descending means beds. And I think if I run that, I get an error because uh, it's not means beds, it's mean beds, right? Okay. Um, and so we can see that the top five are Bartlett, Enfield, Herringy, Mental Health, Bradford, District Care Trust, Camden, Essington, Hertfordshire Partnership University, North Essex Partnership University. So that is what I did. Let's see if we got the same results. Seems like it. So um, you can also check for yourself if you got the right result. The top five should be these five organizations. And you should be left with a data set with a tibble that is 255 rows long and two columns long, assuming that you ended with a summarize and not another mutate. I think if you were to do another mutate, it would, so instead of the summarize, if you did the mutate, it would look like this. Um, and it would have been more difficult for you to see the result because Barnet, which is the first one in line, would appear at the top. So in this case, summarize is more useful than mutate. Although if you were to kind of filter to unique ones and then sort it by top five, you would still get the same result with some with mutate. It's just that summarize is 
better in this case because it's a much more compact, uh, cleaner output. Um, any questions about how we got to this result? And uh, if you wanted me to go through it a little bit slower, please let me know. Right, and just in case, I will copy and paste this link, uh, sorry, this code into the chat so that everybody has the same result, just in case you miss this miss the step or are getting i mean honestly i feel like most errors when it comes to exercises like these have to do with kind of misspelling the variable names because as you saw i had the same issue i spelled means beds instead of mean beds and then i got an error so if you get an error just double check that you have all the variable names correct um yeah even in my work like usually i would get errors because I misspelled something. So always double check your spelling and things like that. And also make sure you have the NA equals, uh, NA remove equals true, because I feel like, oh, actually you get the same results. So maybe the NA is not the problem this time. Yeah, it's always good to have the NA dot remove equals true, just so that you can avoid issues related to missing values as well. And also I would say additionally, to ungroup at the end of this, just so that it's all nice and tidy. And it's kind of like a nice way to finish off the, the code, just to make sure that you get like a clean output that's not a grouped data set. So that, I mean, in this case, you're not really saving this data set anywhere, but if you were to save this data set to use for something else, like maybe you want to plot this as well, then make sure you, you ungroup it. So I would finish it with an ungroup, okay? Okay, let's see what are the final slides here. Then it goes through some extensions that are completely optional. So you, I don't think you need to include this. Uh, if you don't want to, you can just listen. But summarize, with summarize, you can add in uh, a lot more information if you want. So we can also uh, include the number of data points by group using summarize, using the n function. So the n function doesn't, again, doesn't need any additional arguments. You can just do the n and then it will do the count for you. So what this would look like is if you were to do within the summarize, uh, like a new variable called count, for example, and then you did n open close parentheses. And then in this result alongside means beds, you would also get the counts uh, for each organization. Yeah, there's also distinct number that you can use within summarize using the end distinct function. Uh, this time they group by organizational code, but I'll just try it out with organizational name. So distinct number and distinct. Mm, I spelled it wrong. Oh yeah, I have to do it by something. This is just going to, oh, actually this proves that uh, each organizational code is not unique to each organizational name. That was my mistake. So I think if I do or code, it wouldn't do anything because yeah, okay. So organizational code, within each organizational code, there's several organization names. So you definitely should have grouped by the org name. Sorry about that. I don't know the data set that well because I haven't done the session for uh, months, but this is a good, this is a good reminder. So if you were to group by org code and then do end distinct organizational name, you can then find that within each org code, uh, there is, uh, actually it's just one. So distinct number and, mm -hmm. Not sure why I'm not getting the same result. Org code, if I sort by this. Maybe the data set is different. Uh, 
I think it's right. It's just the top ones are showing one. I think there's more. The top one? I think there are more which are, I think most of them one, but so the top results are just returning one. But if you filter oh, it, yeah. if you filter it by more than one, it will show you that others. Yes, and if I do the arrange by district number, I should have the ones at the top as well. Yes, we get that now. Okay, now if I sort, yeah, so that, that proves the point. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, so yeah, you can also do n distinct, so you can see how many distinct values there are within a group by another variable, so you can do that as well with the summarize. Uh, and then I think we can leave select for after our break because this is very, very quick and easy to use verb. It's probably like the last verb that we'll cover. And then I think we'll cover naming conventions, uh, joinings, and then finish it off with a quick introduction to our markdown. And yeah, hopefully we can finish a little bit early because the rest I think should be pretty quick to cover. I think the data wrangling part with the five verbs took the longest time. Um, so well done with sticking with me um, throughout this slide deck. So let's come back at 11.15, uh, well-deserved break, and then we can resume with select and the rest of the, rest of the session. I'm just gonna put in the chat that we are coming back at 11.15. All right. What, what time do you expect we'll finish today? So I think it's scheduled to finish at 1230, but I think we can try to finish 10 or 15 minutes earlier, depending on um, how the session goes, but sure. we may or may not finish early. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. I'll speak to everyone in 15 minutes.
Hi, can uh, I check if everybody's back? See so if you can just send like an emote or like a hands up on Zoom. Or just send in the chat. Yeah, like that. It's fine as well. Just so I can get a sense of who's back. Yep. All right, great. I, th I think that's most people. And I also checked the schedule. We're apparently scheduled to end at one, but obviously that's really late and people will get very hungry by then. So we're definitely not going to finish at one. Don't worry. Um, like I said, 1230 is probably my limit and I'm aiming to finish even earlier than 1230. But people are welcome to kind of stay behind and ask for their questions and, and stuff like that. So you can still have that. Uh, yeah, okay, looks like most people are back, so I can start sharing my screen, and then we can finish all the session. The second half is uh, quite fun, in my opinion. I think the first half is definitely the most, um, it, it, it has the most work in, in the first half, because there, I think the coding is the most intense during the data wrangling bit, because it's really important to understand what all the five verbs are doing. And in my opinion, like the group by is especially quite important to understand. Uh, okay, and if you can't share my screen, please let me know. Again, if my audio is wonky, please let me know. Otherwise, I will just continue on from where we left off. Get back to the slides. loading really slow for some reason. I'm just going to skip to the very end where we left off. Almost there, almost there. Yes. Okay. So we left off at select. So select, I would say, is the verb that I would use either at the start of the operation or somewhere in the middle or at the, at the end of an operation, depending on what you're doing. Select essentially just subsets the number of variables from your data frame. So for example, this is especially, I mean, I, I use select so much that I don't even think about it, but usually when you're presented with a raw data set, you're gonna get a lot of columns that you don't really need. Um, you know, when you do like calculations for like percentage of uh, occupancy based off of beds, you probably just need like two or three columns for that. Um, and you need the organization name, you need the date. But imagine that your data set had a whole bunch of other indicators that you're not interested of. You can kind of just filter those out so that whenever you look at your data set, whenever you look at your output in your console, you're not met with all this um, redundant data that you don't really need. So select just within the select function, you can just include all the names of the variables that you actually want. So in this case, you're selecting just the organization code and the organizational name. So you're just keeping the two variables. Um, so if I go back to, what is this? Oh, this is a file that I just opened. Ignore that. So added a different section for select. Using red data again, and then using the pipe, I use a select. And maybe I just need the date and the org name. Maybe that's all I'm interested in at the moment. I just want to see the date and the organization name. That's all I want. And then maybe from that, I can I can do some additional like mutating or whatever. I mean, with these two columns, I really can't do much. But this is just an example. I mean, in your best data, we do, I think, use every single column, but I think we don't really use the organization, the org code column that much. So, for example, in this case, at like the start of these scripts, you could have done a select to just select date, org name, beds, average, and occupation average. Or the easiest way to do this, if you just want to exclude one column, is to just have the minus sign. So for example, if I just empty out my select here and I just do minus org code and I run that, you'll see that it just returns the data set 
but just with that column excluded. So you're excluding the column that you don't really need. And then you can continue on with like your arranges, like your mutates, your summarize, et cetera, et cetera, at that point. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I should have muted my teams. Sorry. It's kind of like a pre cleanup before you do the operations, or you can choose to do the selection after your uh, operation. So summarize kind of does the selection for you. Summarize because if I, maybe I should mute my team so that happens again. But with summarize, you'll notice that like, for example, if I were to run this code again, it will only keep the uh, columns that we've specifically mentioned, such as mean beds, counts, distinct number, and the thing that you grouped by. So it's got organizational name because that's the variable that you're grouping by. Sorry, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen so I can mute my team's notifications because it's very distracting. Just gonna turn that off for now. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Summary kind of has the select functionality built in it. Whereas if you weren't using summarize and you were using like a mutate, just the mutate and then the arranges and then like the filters, you might wanna do select at the very end so that you have a clean output. So that is how I would generally use select. All right, let's move on. And also, as I mentioned before, just to remove a column, you just do the minus sign in front of the name of the column. Make sure there's no space after the minus sign. Otherwise, it will probably return an error. Make sure it's minus sign and then the name. You can also refer to columns by number. So that would kind of be like, if you're familiar with indexing, it would be like the index number. Um, so here, you're selecting columns from one through three. So that's the first, you're selecting the first three columns. You can also select like two, four, six, et cetera. You can also do that. So let me just show that as well. Um, I'll just start a new beds data, select. So you can either do one through three. If I run that, you'll see that it selected the date, organization code, and organization name. Those are the first three columns. Or you can do... So for this, you'll need uh, another helper function called C. C stands for concatenate. Um, we'll cover C more later, but it's basically used to kind of create a vector at times. Um, I'm just going to do one, three, and five. Yeah. So we've taken the first column, the third column, and then the fifth column. So you can also do that. If you know the exact placements of your columns, I thought I muted my settings off. yeah please please stop <laughs> okay so if you know the exact numbers of your columns you can do that instead because sometimes you can work with a very wide data set and you don't want to mention every single name right because that's like it might take you a long time to type out but if you know the exact placements of your columns that'll make it easier so you just need to include the numbers so that's a that's an easier way of doing it if you've got a very wide data set you can also select uh using everything the everything helper function is really useful sometimes especially as i mentioned for a wide data set if you know specifically that you just want to include um, include one column so that it's at the start, and then you want to keep everything, you can use the everything function. So let me just show you what that does. It's especially great for Y data sets. So let's say that you want to move a column that's usually at the back, so maybe uh, occupancy. So you want the occupancy average first and then comma and then you want everything else so make sure that after everything you have the open and close 
parentheses. You run that, you'll see that what it returns is you've got the, occup the occupancy first, and then you've got all the rest of the columns right after it. So this is a great way of not sh just showing that select can uh, kind of filter your column, but it can also restructure it. So if you want the most important columns at the front, you can do that using select. And obviously you can do like several things to be at the front. So you can do both occupancy and beds to be at the front and then everything else at the back. So this is a great way of just pre-cleaning your data so that when you're viewing your data after you've done like the data wrangling, you can, you can see it so that it's easier for you to interpret the information rather than just having this long, uh, wide data set with columns that you don't really need to see. Right, any questions about select before I move on to the last section? Okay, moving on. So vectors, I think I briefly mentioned last week. Uh, vectors are the simplest type of data structure in R. Simply put, a vector is a sequence of data elements of the same basic type. So I'm not sure if we've ever used vectors before. Oh, actually, we just did one just now. So using concatenate, we've created a vector of 1, 3, and 5. So this is a vector. If you, so if I just copy and paste this into like a new line, if I just print this in the console, you see a one dimensional vector. And I think I mentioned previously before in uh, last week that a data frame, so this table is essentially several vectors together and a data, a data frame is kind of like a two dimensional, um, what do you call it, element, like a two dimensional element within, uh, with, within our terms. The three-dimensional element would then be the list, which you might use more if you were doing for loops um, and other uh, functions, operations, maybe like outputs with several formats, like plots and data frames and vectors together. But we don't need to cover lists and for loops because those are more intermediate R level concepts, I think. And I think there might be a separate course about intermediate level R. So look out for that if you're interested in what I just mentioned. But for now, we're just going to stick with vectors and data frames. So if you can imagine like this C135, it's just a sequence of numbers. It's one dimensional. But if you were to pile several of these sequences together, then it would become a data frame. So the bed's average column is just by itself a sequence of numbers. So this entire column, you could say that this entire column is just a vector. So I would... Yeah, hopefully that explanation of vectors makes sense. And obviously your vectors can include strings. So hi, I'm Annie. If I print this, this is also a vector. It's just a vector of strings, which is uh, strings. You can call them strings. You can call them characters. You can call it text, you know, bits of text. And you can include both numerics and strings together. Hi. Oops. Let's just do one and high. And then when it comes to vectors, if you put both numerics and strings together, it will default to one or the other. So in this case, strings is kind of the more dominant one. So it will convert the one into a string as well. So this one is now not numerical. You can't really sort it as a numerical value. You can only sort it as an alphabetical kind of value. So it will default to that. I think also logicals, it will default string. So yeah, true will also turn into a string. I haven't tested it, but what if it's a numerical and a logical? Yeah, in that case, the logical will turn into a one because also very interesting, false will then turn into zero, which makes a lot of sense in the binary case. Um, so those are vectors. You can mix them together, but the vector can only be one format and it will choose a dominant format so if it's a string with a with anything else, it will default to a string. If it's numerical with logical, it will default to a numerical. Hopefully that makes sense. You can create a vector with the C functions I mentioned, which stands for concatenate or combine. And yes, it could be numerical values, it could be strings, or you could mix it together. Um, 
if you do mix it together, it will result in it being all strings. I'm quite proud that even though it's been months, I still remember most of the content of these slides. Um, so quite, quite happy with that. Um, it is very useful when you're trying to filter, for example. So if we can go back to like the filtering bit, right? Like, I don't think we need to do any new code. I'm just going to like show you from the previous code that we've done. If you haven't kept it, that's okay. Everything's going to be online for you to see anyway. It's just for your information. So for example, in this filter one, if you wanted to filter not just to one date, but to several dates, you would do that with a vector. So I'm just going to add in this additional uh, step just so that you could kind of see it. You can follow along if you want or if you don't want to, it's fine. But yeah, when it comes to actually filtering with vectors, you can't do the, the double equal sign. Um, because the double equal sign will only accept one value. So you actually need to do the in operator, which means that you, you want to find the date within a specific range. And then you can give a specific range, which you can do with a vector. And then you can do, you know, 2018-09-01 and 2018-10-01. Oh, I think that exists. Does that exist? Okay, let's do 601 because I see it there. One. If I run that, it will then filter to uh, dates included in everything within this vector. So again, right now we only see 2018. Maybe if I uh, group by the date and then Summarize, because I just kind of want to prove a point. Mm -hmm. And then spell this naturally. Yeah, yeah it only filters to these, to these two dates. I kind of just want to prove my point that it successfully filtered it to everything within that vector. But you can imagine this is very powerful, because now you can filter within anything within like the five organizations of your interest or like all the dates that you're interested in, um, all the age groups that you're interested in. Maybe it's like, you know, people like to usually look at like 60, 65 plus, um, but you could also want to look at, you know, 40 to 60 or like 40, 40 to 50, you know? So in that case, you would include it all within your vector and then you can use the filter on it. So hopefully that makes sense. And just in case you do want this code to try it out yourself, I will put it in the chat if you have it. Okay, because it is a good example for how you can use vectors. Right, so it does include the in operator, which I mentioned just looks for everything within a certain uh, vector or structure to be completely accurate. If you want to look for something that is not within the vector, then you would put in an exclamation point at the front of it. So it's like a little bit unintuitive when I was learning it, but you actually don't put the question mark in front of the in operator. That doesn't work. You put the question mark in front of the start of the statement. So in this case, if you run it, then you will get everything, like all the dates that are not in the vector that we specified. So everything should have a negation. In this case, uh, in R, the negation is usually with the uh, exclamation point operator, uh, which then successfully negates this uh, statement of trying to find everything within these two dates. And for SQL users, this is sort of the, how it would translate to SQL code if you do use SQL. I think um, NHS uh, analysts use SQL a lot, which is why this slide was included, just so that it could uh, help you with understanding if you're an SQL user, because it basically works the same way. Okay, any questions about select and vectors?
sorry, quick question. Yeah. Say say you had like a very large inclusion, uh, you know, if you wanted to select from a large list of things, could you have like a table of that criteria which you could select from instead? Uh, a table to do what, sorry? So say if you had like 50 organizations that you want to filter by. Mm. So rather than typing that into one big vector, could you just have that in a table which you pull in to be your select criteria? Yes, that's a great point, actually. So, okay, say that you have two, okay, um, how do I make this example? Okay, say that you basically want to filter this data set to maybe like 50 of these organizational names and you have a different table or data set with those names, yeah. right? Like I mentioned before, vectors make up data frames. So all you kind of need to do is just reference the name of the column from another data set. So for this example, I'm going to duplicate the beds data to beds two. So I'm just going to do beds data organizational name. I'm going to select the first 50 and I'm going to do the unique names of them. Let me see if that turns. Okay, so returns a vector of 50. That is what I want. So let's say that you have a different data set with that. What you would do, so I'm going to unvectorize it now. I'm just going to select 1 to 50, but it's still a data frame. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Placement. Okay. So now you got the second table where we have the organizational names, right? So what you would do in that case is if I just copy, we just copy this code again. You would do org name that is in the second data set, that two, specific column org name. So this um, dollar sign operator, thank you for the question, by the way, because this is very useful to know. When you're dealing with data sets, you can call in each variable in the data set as its own vector. So for example, if I do bed, just so that anybody can do it, if you do bed data, dollar sign, org name, and then you just run that piece of code, you will see that it returns the column by itself as a very long vector. Right, so these, this is just the entire column of beds data. So now that we know that each column is essentially just a very long vector, we can do this using the filter. So same logic, um, if you have bed two as a second data set with all the names, just reference bed two and then the name of the column from that second data set. Then if I run this, it will work just the way as you described. Um, except I think I don't want to group by date. I want to group by org name. Yeah, it returns a table of 50 rows because we successfully filtered it to the 50 organizations in the second data set. Does that make sense? Great, thank you, that's really useful. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, you know what? I might just copy and paste this code into the chat again in case you found that useful because I do have to do this quite often in my work as well. So using uh, data from a second data set to kind of filter. And I think we're gonna cover this briefly as well when we talk about joining data sets, which is slightly different from this example, but it's still kind of related. Any other questions about this? Okay, All right. So we move on to naming objects, which doesn't really have a lot of coding involved. So I think it's a relaxing section. So naming objects, this is really, I think this uh, slide deck is mainly about naming conventions mainly. So when you're doing, so if you remember when we were doing like all the group by and summarize things, we were naming new variables. 
And you'll notice that when we're dealing with data sets in R for this session in particular, that the names tend to have this certain style to it. There's no capital letters, there's no spaces, there are no hyphens, which might be slightly different. If you're working in, if you've ever worked in JavaScript or like a different uh, programming language, you might have different conventions for your names. Uh, I know that with JavaScript, they like to capitalize names. Um, but in R, typically, we don't really do that. We keep everything lowercase. And then if there's a space between words, we use the under underscore. Next step, visualize. Piecing it together, we can put the output into the ggplot2 code from the previous week. So what this essentially is saying is that Commonly, the next step of the data wrangling is to put it into a plot. So for example, after we've found uh, my R session just crashed, but I don't think that's a problem because hopefully it would have saved everything. This is why the control S shortcut is so useful for when for when this happens. Okay, thankfully it didn't erase all that work. Cool, so if we go back to, for example, any of the, the longer code that we've done, after you get this result, you know, like the mean beds, um, you, you found like the top five organizational name for mean beds, you might want to plot it into like a line graph or a bar graph, um, scatter plot maybe probably is not a scatter plot in this case but you know you probably want to graph probably want to do a graph using ggplot using like the skills that you built up from last week so what i would usually do is i would just like for example if i just copy and paste this uh, continuing to plot. so if i just cop copy and paste this i can continue the operation using the pipe and then i would just put my ggplot code in here and because the first argument of dplyr packages is always um the data set you actually don't really need to include the first argument you remember that the first argument for a ggplot is df equals something you actually don't need to include that now because you just piped in the previous clean data set into your ggplot i mean if i run this it's going to produce an empty plot but it shows you that it's worked and that it's created a blank ggplot object. I haven't told it what the x and the y axis is, but you know, it's just kind of illustrate my point. So usually that's what I would do. Or because sometimes this data wrangling bit could get very long, you might not want to pipe it into your ggplot because you kind of want to separate your code for cleanliness sakes. You kind of want it um, to not continue into an even longer chunk of code it's really about just thinking about if you have to share your code with a colleague you don't want your colleagues to just see this massive um un unstopping chunk of code you know you kind of want breaks in between so that your colleague gets a chance to kind of digest okay this chunk of code is for the data cleaning this chunk of code is for the plotting so what i would do is i would usually save the clean code after i'm happy with it to a new data frame. So for example, I could call it clean underscore data, and then I would use the assignment operator using the less than followed by the hyphen. It looks like an arrow, so it makes sense in that regard. Um, like I said, you could do the equal sign as well, but standard, our users like to use the assignment operator. And then you can run this you'll notice the console doesn't return anything. It's because what is returned is that it's saved your clean data into a new data set. It should appear in your global environment now. So like that's the tab on the right side. You'll see that the clean data has appeared. You can click on it. You can look at it just to make sure that it's correct. That's the wrong one. Yeah, so this is the correct one, the clean data. And then using this clean data, you can then use the ggplot. You can then say that the df is uh, clean data. And then you can do like the um, 
Beyond bar stuff, a aesthetic, you know, x equals something, y equals something. I don't think I need to do that now, but I think you, you know, you get what I'm saying. So it's always good to, um, you know, when you're done with the data set and you want to do more, to just save it as its own data set. And then you can keep using that clean data set for future operations like plotting, tabling, putting it into an R markdown, putting it into a report manipulating it further, feeding it into a model, et cetera, et cetera. So what this slide is actually trying to say is like, so say that this is your, um, you know, you clean the data. You don't want to put this entire chunk of code into your ggplot. You want to save it. Yeah, keep wrangling separate, essentially. Keep your code as readable as possible. So this whole chunk of code can be named. So they named it beds. TS, and then you can use the bed TS within your GG plot. Hopefully that makes sense. And this goes back to naming conventions. So when you're naming a new object, it's always good to make sure that it's descriptive so that, again, thinking about your colleague that has never seen your code before, they see an object called clean data, they're like, oh, okay, this, this data set is probably the clean one. Um, but it should also be good to be descriptive. So actually it would have been best if instead of naming it clean data, I would have named it clean beds data or something. Cause there could be a whole category of clean data sets. You know, it could have worked with like other capacity data sets that are not just about beds data. So it's good to be specific about what kind of data set you are. And actually in this case, maybe I don't even need to specify that it's clean. Maybe if I just save it as beds data, my colleague will know that this is the data set to use when it comes to analysis regarding beds occupancy. Which goes into the second point, try to keep it shortish um, as much as you can, but descriptive as well. And it should be consistent with other names. So you should have named one data set beds data and the other capacity, DF. You know, try to try to keep them kind of consistent so that when somebody sees your code, they'll be like, oh, okay, beds data, capacity data, um, you know, flu data or something. So they kind of have the same convention. They kind of have the shared consistency. So yes, as mentioned before, the R convention is to use the following assignment operator. It looks like an arrow. Interestingly, and I don't recommend that you do this, but just to show you that it is something that can be done, you can also do the opposite kind of arrow. So you can do the assignment at the end, just to show you that that works. It does work, but I would recommend not, do, I mean, it, it's something that can't be done, which is why I'm showing it to you. But I would just recommend assigning it at the start because it's, it's a lot more readable in my opinion. I do know that there are people who like to do the assignment at the end for some reason, and they might have their own reasons for it. There's also a shortcut for doing this assignment operator. It is alt and then hyphen. So if you want, if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, I personally think the assignment operator is short enough that I, I don't need the shortcut, but it's uh, you're free to do whatever is comfortable for you. Right, and after you saved it, it will appear in your environment as uh, illustrated. And yes, you can view this by running the code line, the, the name of the data set. So we just saved the bed underscore TS, right? You can actually bring it up by typing bed underscore TS and then running that, and then it will print it in your console. Because the command itself is to just show it in the console which is different from, if you remember, if you do the view bed TS, it will actually pop up uh, in a different view. But if you just do bed TS in itself, it will just print uh, the data set in your console. Okay, so that's the difference. Also, another tip that I just thought of, uh, in case you're interested, sometimes when you're coding and then you realize that some of the previous code was redundant, I like to comment out by doing control shift. Oh, 
what was it again? Control Shift C, yes. So Control Shift C is another useful shortcut because it will comment a whole selection of code for you. So if you're ever in the situation where you find that you kind of want to keep the code there just for reference six, but you don't want the script to run it every time, then just like select all of it and then press Control, Control Shift C and it will comment out everything. Uh, and you can keep on pressing it if you want to uncomment it. So it's 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 really uh, easy like that. Well, let's move on. Right. Uh, returning to the plot. Once again, this is the this is long code that you kind of want to avoid because it's kind of sore on the eyes. It is much cleaner if you just do data equals beds underscore ts because you're saving this entire thing as its own thing called beds underscore ts and then all you need to do is call that one data set and it keeps the script much cleaner much nicer looking and much more accessible for other people also it's great because i imagine if you're doing one plot you might want to do another plot using the same data set so just save the data set so you can reuse it essentially Uh, yes, and I don't think we really need to do this because I think it's quite easy to understand. But if you want um, to just make a plot, then you can do a very basic G on point with ggplot using the, the beds TS with date as the x-axis and mean beds as the y. And then you can run your plot and then you can see how it looks. Um, but I don't really think we need to do that because it's quite self-explanatory. And just as a reminder of the naming style, I think in R, we tend to favor the snake case. So it's called snake case. I think it's because like the underscore looks like a snake at the ground. But there are other cases as well. So camel case, I think is quite popular in JavaScript users. So they like to have the first word small case and then the second word and any subsequent words as um, with capitalized uh, first letter. Pascal case, I think, I don't, there might be people who use this, but haven't really seen it. Kebab case, I also haven't really seen much of. Essentially, it's like the same as snake case, but with a hyphen instead of the underscore. I feel like I've seen it in some language, but I've forgotten. But just so you know, we tend to use snake case. You might encounter camel case if you work with a lot of interactive elements so because as i mentioned javascript tends to use camel case so if you get into like really interactive dashboards and and plots and widgets essentially anything that you can kind of interact with on the user side you might encounter variable names with the with the camel case because they're kind of built in the the code um with that again it's a translation of javascript to r sometimes but yeah I think I also mentioned that I'm doing a class on like a teaching session about interactive plotting at some point this year. So if you attend that, then you will come across a lot of Campbell cases. Okay, that's the that's the end of the slide deck. Uh, any questions about uh, naming? Think not. Okay. Let's move on to relational data. So this is a short slide deck, but I think it's quite important because essentially introduces a new set of functions or verbs, again from the dplyr package related to joining data sets. But you know, obviously this is quite important because I find that at least as a Data analyst for me personally, I end up joining data sets really, really often because I always have one data set where I have, you know, the values that I'm interested in, and then another data set with like geography lookups or ID lookups and, and stuff like that. So you always kind of need, you're always kind of in the situation where you need to join data sets by something. And we can do that using the following uh, functions. So yes, it's rare to find all the data you need for analysis in a single table. 
Typically, you have to link two or more tables together by matching on a common key variable, like an ID variable, like NHS number, or something like a geography code. In SQL, you use joins as well. So if you're an SQL user, you're probably familiar with the idea of joining data sets. VLOOKUPs, if you're using Excel. We'll mainly focus on left or outer joins for this session. And the syntax is similar for every type of joins that we'll encounter. So we'll start with the most popular one, which is easily left join. So if you can see the, the GIF, uh, it kind of illustrates what a left join does. So you have the X data set, which is the first data set, and you want a column from a second data set you just want to join it by some kind of shared ID column. Everything within the first data set is kept, while every, everything in the second data set that matches with the first data set is combined with the first data set. And that is why it's called a left join, because it favors the left data set. Yeah, so it keeps the structure of table X and match observations in table Y. Um, again, this is probably a concept familiar to a lot of people because we do it quite often when we do analysis. So obviously for this to work, we need some key variables. So this is usually like some kind of ID variable, some code, uh, organization code, organization name, something that is unique, you know? So to do this, we would call the first data set, which... For now, we just call X because it's on the left. Pipe it, and then we use the left join to Y by the name of the ID column. And the name of the ID column is in quotation marks because for this particular function, it only accepts a string for the by argument. So that is the basic syntax. I think it's quite easy to understand. Um, yeah, let's move on. So for this exercise, we are going to join two tables, one with cases of tuberculosis by country and one with population by country. This is probably because we want to derive some kind of case rate. So let's import the these three data sets, tb cases.csv, tb pop.csv, and tb new table.csv. So quite a few new ones. Again, you can decide to start a new script or you can just add in a different section. This time I'll just add in a new section, relational data. And as a reminder, if you wanna add in a new section, the shortcut is control shift R. So I think it's easy to understand because R is in the software that we're using. So control shift R will insert a new section for you. So that is what I'm choosing to do for this one. And then we want to import three new data sets. I think in this case, I want to clean my environment so that it's all nice and reset because it's quite busy. You don't need to do that. It's just a personal thing. Okay, so it's it's these three data sets we want to import. Um, so I'm just gonna do library dplyr, library radar, and then I'm going to, let me see. Should we keep the original names? Yeah, we keep the original names. TV cases, uh, read underscore CSV, TV underscore cases dot CSV, and then TV pop, same thing. It's just typing a bunch of stuff, really. We can't be bothered to type it all. I will also copy and paste into the chat. Save you that time. All right, so after running all this, you should have these, these three data sets in your environment. They're all 16 rows long, but they have, like each column is obviously different for each one. So that should be the case. You run that. Okay, so we're going to start with a left join. We're going to keep the original structure of the TB cases data frame. So that would be our data frame X. 
And then we want to match to rows in TB pop. So we want to get the population column from the second data set based on the unique value, which is country. So just to double check, whenever you're doing a join, make sure that you are joining on a unique column. So I think all these countries look the same. Yes. So what we're going to do as a left join, the start is we're going to take TB cases to the pipe and then do the left underscore join function on TB pop. The first argument is your Y data frame. And then you want to specify that you want to join it by the country. Let me just bring this up again. By the country column. And they have a share name, which is convenient. So this should be a relatively easy join by country. And make sure that when you specify by country, it is a string. So you need the quotation marks around the country. All right, and if you run that, we'll see that it has successfully brought the pop column in, in here. Um, so yeah, it's done what we wanted. Now I did notice something which we will get to. So yes, this is the output that we would expect. It is exactly what we got. So one thing that I, I immediately noticed is when you have the, when you do a left join and then suddenly you're met with column names that look like year.x and year.y. What this means is that during the join, it has noticed that you have duplicates. When there are duplicates, how left join kind of copes with the fact that there are duplicates is it will create two versions or it will create a, a second version of the column that it's noticed that there are duplicates in. So that is why they, it's made a new column called year.y and has further changed the name of the original column into year.x. Because originally in TB cases, the column name is called year. But after the left join, it's changed it to year.x. Because left join is trying to cope with the fact that there are duplicates, it's going to be like, all right, I will still do this operation, but I just want to let you know that there are duplicates within the year column in both these two data sets. So I'm going to kind of separate them out so that the operation can still work. So you'll notice that if I sort by country, Afghanistan and you know every country kind of appears several times and then the year is different. So actually joining by country was not the proper uh, the proper thing to do because country is not unique. It's actually unique if you include both country and year. So this kind of like, this kind of sounds like the conversation we had when we were doing a group by, right? It's kind of like, yeah, if I sort this as well, country is not unique. So what I wanna do instead um, is to do TB cases, left join, and you want, to join TB pop by two variables. So you open up a concatenate because you're opening up a vector. You're now including two things now. You want to join by both country and year. And this will kind of tell left join that, you know, only when you're looking at both country and year are the values unique. Because if you just use country, if you just use year, they're not unique. But if you use both, then it will be unique. And then you can actually do a proper join. So if I then run this, then you'll notice that the year column name does not change. And it overall looks a lot neater. All it has done is it's brought forth the pop column into TB cases, which is what we need. Let me just check that the slides did exactly that. Yep. And it just gives you a reminder of the fact that concatenate creates a vector. So what we just did is we, we fed it a vector so that it could join the two data sets according to that vector. Okay. Uh, any questions on what we covered so far about left join? All right, let's move on. 
So what left join is really good at actually is that it can actually spot unique values by itself. So actually when we we're specifying like by country or by country year, we're actually kind of saying that, you know, we know better than the, than the function, you know, we want to kind of take control of it. But actually if you let the function do its thing on its own, so if you just do left join, pb pop, left join will kind of do the search on its own. It will kind of look for unique values on its own. So you actually don't need to always specify the uh, ID column. So you'll see that if I just run this without specifying what to join by, it actually just noticed that you should join by country and year. And it will tell you that it's doing that. So it will print out this helpful little text right after you uh, run the code. It will say, I've joined by country and year because that is what the function thinks it would work best. I would advise against normally doing this because it's always better to have all the information in the code that you've written Again, just think about giving this code to your colleague. If you're giving this code to your colleague, you kind of just want all the information to be there for your colleague. You don't want to just leave them with this. Um, just keep them like kind of guessing on what you joined by. So I would say like, if you're ever unsure of the unique ID in your two data sets, you can use this to kind of get a, get a clue on what it is. And then after you see, oh, you, it joined by country and year and it worked fine then include it in your code. So that, that, that is what I would do. But yeah, it is, uh, you know, left join is quite, quite smart on its own. So that is quite neat. Okay, but what if the ID columns in your two data sets do not share the same name? That is an easy fix. So I think this is why they included this uh, third data set called TB new table because it essentially uh, has the same kind of structure in that there, there are several countries and then there are several years within the countries. So we can try to left join these two instead of the population one. Okay, so let's try the TV cases again, do the pipe again, do the left join again. This time let's do TV underscore new table. And then let's just take a look at the two data sets. So in TB new table, the column name is called place. And in TB cases, the column name is called country. Year is also different. So one is YR and one is year. So what you're going to do is, again, we do know that we have to join by country or year. It looks like the two data sets are structured pretty much the same way. It's just that the column names are different. So we're just going to do by um, C country equals place. So this is kind of just some further specification, okay, in that you're specifying that you want to join country and place. So let me just finish typing it out. So this is still saying that you want to join by country and year, but you want to specify that country in the first data set, the X data set, is equivalent to the place column in the second data set. Vice versa, year in the X data set is equivalent to uh, YR in the Y data set. And if we run this, we can see that the left join has been successful. It has successfully brought in the additional column from the Y data set that's called first letter. And there's no like messy year dot x year dot y business going on, so we can assume that everything has been clean. Another way to check if your join is successful is not just to see if your column names have changed, but also to see if the size of your data frame has changed or not. So we know that our x data frame tb underscore cases has sixteen rows, right? Because we're doing a left join we expect there to be no additional rows coming in. So we expect that 16 observations will stay 16 after the join. And we can see that in the tibble, it says there are 16 observations, which means that nothing went wrong. 
the join was most likely successful. And like SQL, dplyr has other joins, not just left join. We've got inner join, we've got full join, we've got right join. Right join is just the opposite of the left join, meaning that everything within the Y data set is kept instead of the X data set. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's been mentioned before. Uh, these slides mention this join called a semi-join. The semi-join doesn't really bring any columns from the Y data set. It just, it's kind of like a way of filtering your data set by a different data set, which is useful. I feel like this is kind of similar to the example that we went through where I was filtering by a second data set. It's just a different way to do it. I personally almost never do semi-joins. I feel like the only times I've done the semi-join is when I'm teaching this class. Um, I usually just like to do a filter and then I like to specify the column that I'm filtering by. But I guess there is a use case in that, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there is, there is a use case. I haven't really used it before, but we can, we can have a go at doing a semi-join. So say that we want to find hospital patients who have COVID-19 tests. We want to only bring back the information in the hospital, nothing about the test. So essentially you just want to keep the information from the X data set, nothing from the Y, even though you want to filter by the Y. So in this case, you're joining TB new table and bring back only records where the first letter is A, but nothing from TB new table. And this code is kind of long winded, um, but I will try to briefly explain it. I don't think it's worth spending too much time explaining this because I personally think that there are better ways to do this anyway. Um, I will just kind of separate things out so it's a little bit cleaner. So let's see, TV new, okay. So table A, so this table A. And I'll copy and paste this code into the chat. So don't worry about that. Okay, so I'm just gonna do table A because I like to, the, I like to do the filtering outside of the dplyr verbs because I feel like it's cleaner. And I'm feeding in table A into here. And then I'm just doing the standard joining operation where I'm saying that, you know, I want to join by country and year, but I'm doing a semi join instead. So what it's going to look like is it's basically going to return TB cases. But what it's done is it's filtered to just four, which means that it's filtered to everything that matches in table A. Um, and that's, that's all it does. So it's just a different way of filtering your data set according to another data set. I would say that I can do this using the dplyr filter verb. So for example, I can just do table cases filter, and then um, let's see what table A looks like. So place and year. So I would say that I am filtering where Country is in the table A place. In addition, year is in table A year. If I run that, it will return the same result as you can see. So whichever one you prefer to use, it does it does the same thing. Let me put this into the chat. Actually, I'm just going to put in some comments here. Say filtered Y data. Do semi join filter uh, X data to Y data. And then use dpliers filter filter data to white data. so that you have all the information. 
Okay. So that is semi join. Any questions so far about left join and semi join? There's um, a question in the chat about how semi join compares to inner join, which might be worth um, discussing. Semi join versus inner join? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just remind myself what inner join does. Only keeps the observations from X that have a matching key and Y. Let me try an inner join because that is a good question. Again, an inner join I really haven't used. So let's see what that does. It does return four, but it has brought in the extra column from the Y data set. So I would say that that is a difference, which makes sense. So an inner join makes sure that um, it matches by what you're matching by. And it does the same thing as semi join, but it will also bring in the additional columns from your Y data set. Whereas with semi join, you're not bringing in anything. So if I rerun this, you'll see that it's just three columns. When I do the inner join, it brings in the additional column from Y. Does that answer your question? Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the question because I'm not sure why the slides didn't mention inner join. Mm, it mentions anti join. Yeah, but it's good that you mentioned it so that we we kind of uh, completed all the verbs. You know, we we went through left join, right join, semi join, inner join, and now anti join. And we didn't really test left join, but as I said before, it's it's the same as left join, but you keep everything from the Y side instead of the X side. So I think it's quite easy to understand. Um, Anti-join is anything that are not matching you keep. So if you see the GIF, um, I'm just waiting for it to refresh. So as you can see from the GIF, one and two match. So what the anti-join does is it's only gonna keep the third row because the third row is the only one that doesn't match. So anti-join is the antithesis of inner join, which we just saw. Anti-join also very simple. All of these verbs have the same syntax. So it's super easy for you to just test it out on your own. Anti-join. And I'm just going to copy and paste the code because it's basically the same. Oops. Yeah. Only thing is I'm going to say anti-join instead. And if I do that, you'll see that what it does, it returns a data set of 12. Because if you remember when we did the, the inner join, it's returned four from the original 16. So the, the anti-join returns the, the 12 that did not match. So you'll see that all the Afghanistan matches are gone. It's just countries that are not Afghanistan. And this is useful if you're trying to like, again, it's, it's a way to like filter out things. So if you have like a second data set that contain like organization names that you know you don't want in your analysis, then you can use that as a way to filter out your first data set. Um, and also with anti-join, just important to know, it also does not bring in any of the, uh, of the columns in the Y data set. So actually in that case, it's not the exact opposite of inner join because inner join will bring in the, the column in your Y data set, whereas anti join, it is similar, more similar to semi join, I guess, in that it will just filter your X data set. If you're ever unsure about these things, I would say just test some like really basic code just to make sure that, you know, you understand the difference in my personal experience for you know, simplicity's sake. I just use left join the most, and then everything else I tend to use filter. But it is good to understand what all these joins are doing. 
Anti join is good if you're doing like um, analysis, though. It's just that essentially it's a way of filtering. So you could do it different ways. Uh, and that is the end of the slide deck. Um, any questions so far about anything we've covered before I move on to the very last bit, which is just a demo of our markdown? There's not a lot of coding involved. It's just to kind of show you what it does. No? Okay. Let's move on to R Markdown. So I'm just going to explain what R Markdown is, and I'm just going to show you what it does. I don't think there's really any coding necessary because it's all done for you. So in your project folder, if you can just do one thing, if you can go into the ignore folder, which is counterintuitive because it says ignore, but we're not ignoring it. I'm not quite sure it's formatted this way, but let's just go with it. In the ignore folder, there's an R Markdown folder. And then in this folder, they're around like the third file, um, 10 intro R markdown dot RMD, if you just bring that up. Right. So I just want to go through the, the structure of an R markdown document, right? So an R markdown document is kind of a different format from uh, an R script, but it kind of works the same way. So in R markdown, you have places where you can add in free text. So it's kind of like a mishmash of Microsoft Word, HTML, and uh, R script or Python script, actually. I think you can actually do a little bit of Python, but I think you need to install a package. Anyway, we're not learning Python today. We're learning R. So in an R Markdown document, you can include code in addition to including uh, like headers and uh, text. So similar to how you would just write text normally in like notebook or Microsoft Word. You can bold things using a uh, double asterisk. So the insert button will be bolded in this case. And then you have chunks uh, that are created with these uh, three kind of, I forgot what this is called, but it's the, uh, it's the key on the top left corner of your keyboard. It's not an apostrophe, it's, I forgot what it was called, but it is that key like right under escape at the, at the top left corner of your keyboard. So it is denoted by, uh, by these, by three of these, and then by the language that the code is in. And you can include code like this familiar one about importing the beds data. And then you can put like, you can imagine you can put like plots in here, you can put tables in here. So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm going to show you how to run parts of the R Markdown document. So in this document, you'll notice that for the R chunks in particular, so any chunk that is kind of grayed out like this is a code chunk. Usually, uh, they, you know, you'll be able to see that it's an R chunk. There might be some exceptions if you're using like Python or different languages. I think you can use HTML and stuff. Um, if you click on this kind of greenish button here, run with chunk then you're just running the entire code. You'll see that in your console, you have ran library tidyverse, for example. And then, you know, you can include some text, you know, some introductory text into your report. Essentially, our markdown is for making reports. You can make HTML reports, you can make Word document reports, you can make PDFs. Um, there are probably other formats. I think you can make presentations as well, although I haven't done that a lot, but you can knit these into a range of things. We'll see that just in a second. Um, this code, we don't need to run because it's just the comment, but if we can skip to around line 50, there's another code, so we can run that. Um, it will return an error because the path is wrong. I think you need to do a dot dot. Let me see if that solves it. Nope, we need another dot dot. I think there's been some issue. I think this file is not supposed to be in the ignore folder, which makes a lot of sense. So sorry about that. But yeah, once you when when you get to line 50, if you can add in like the dot dot slash dot dot slash right before the beds data and then run it, you'll notice that it's run the code and then it will show up in your environment. And then you can run this. 
and then you'll be met with this nice, kind of nice ggplot showing that, you know, code does indeed work in the R markdown document. Um, but if you ran the code or not, it's fine because um, the end result is already available. So if you want to try knitting your document and make sure that's why I asked you like the one thing that you should do is you should fix this, this path right here. So if you can please add the dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash right before bed status that looks like this. And then we can knit it and then we can uh, finish, I think, right on time at 12.30. So sorry, didn't finish like before 12.30, like I promised, but I think we covered some uh, very, very useful things in the meantime. So after you've done that correction, if you can click on the knit button, it's the icon that has a yarn on it, which is very cute in my opinion. Um, it returns an error, error in YAML. This time, talk true. Why is there an error in the YAML? Scanning simple thing, I cannot expect it. Oh, okay. That is interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Let me see if this fixes it. Okay, that fixes it. Uh, right, so to fix it, essentially just make sure that the beginning YAML header, so this is called a YAML header. It's kind of like the metadata for your document. Everything that you specify here is uh, usually stuff like the title, the date, the output format, which in this case we want to be an HTML document. There are other things, additional things that you can add in like uh, TOC, which stands for table of contents. I will show you how that looks in a second, but just make sure that your YAML header has just output HTML document for simplicity's sakes and to avoid that error. And that it should print out this R Markdown document. So as you can see, all the content in this report now should match the content of your R Markdown file. So all the headers correspond to what you've written in here. So the single, uh, the single header uh, is the biggest one. And the more kind of hashtags you add in, the smaller the header that is kind of just denoting, um, what's it called, the hierarchy of the headers. So that's how you denote that. You'll notice the insert text here that has the two apostrophes around it has been bolded. So that's how you can format certain things. And I think if it's one apostrophe, it's italicized. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ruth. There is a whole kind of guide on how you can format things in our markdown. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about learning everything now. It's all a case of like, when I was first starting, I was just kind of looking at the guide. So like, okay, that's how you italicize things. That's how you uh, change the the text size and and stuff. So it's it's all about looking at the, the cheat sheet. Um, and then let's see if the plot, the plot, sorry. The plot is here. So again, this corresponds to everything in your R Markdown document. Bullet points, let's see where the bullet points are. So bullet points are denoted by a single asterisk followed by more asterisks. That will result in it looking like this. Numbered lists, you kind of have the at. So that will make it look like this. And then if you want things that are kind of eye-catchy, maybe for like disclaimers or like comments about data quality or introductory text with this uh, nice little separation here, um, you can use the bigger than symbol to make it look like that. Yeah, so this uh, R Markdown document is kind of just to show you how you can structure the text differently. And then also just to show you that you can put stuff like plots into your reporting. And you can just imagine how useful this is when you're uh, making reports because this is essentially automating your report, right? So you got places where you can add in your code. So that accepts the code that we've been doing in like the data wrangling section, the ggplot section. So all that code you can just put into a code chunk here 
run it, create a plot, and then you're essentially automating the reporting process. All you need to do at that point is to make sure that your code is clean, that it works, and then you can just give it to your colleague and they can press the knit button and then they will get the same report as you. And then if you're updating the data set like every month or every year, all you need to change is probably like the data set, maybe like one or two parameters. And then you can just rerun the thing and you'll just get the same output, but we're just with a more updated data set. So um, our markdown, they're, they're very powerful, but honestly, I feel like just me kind of speaking at you uh, regarding our markdown is not as effective as you just going home and having a player around with it. Because once you've understood the fact that an R markdown document is just a mix of you writing text in it and formatting the text and our code and our outputs, then you've basically gotten the idea of how to use an R markdown document. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Are there any questions about R markdown documents? No, and maybe it's because people are hungry, which is completely fair. But also in the same R Markdown folder, you'll see that there is a Word document example, which I think goes straight into your downloads before you can see it. So these are just to show you that you can knit, which is the term, or render R Markdown documents into other formats, not just HTML, but Word documents. You can also do PDF, which is a little bit of a hassle because you need to download another package, but there are tutorials online that you can look for. And to make a new R Markdown document, just click on the, the new file, and then there is a separate option for R Markdown. There you can include title, and actually here you can select which, which format that you want. So again, with, with PDF output, you do need to install some latex helping packages. It's a bit hard to explain, but HTML and Word are really easy. So just select HTML and it'll just create kind of like this template for you. And here you can just have a play around, as I said. And it does give a link to like this, uh, this website, rmarkdown.rstudio, where you can find cheat sheets and ways to just format your R Markdown uh, differently. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, happy to end the session here. If you have any questions, um, I think I'll stay online for another 10 minutes just in case there are any extra questions for me. If not, thank you for you know attending the session. I know it's been a long commitment, um, you know, two days long. <laughs> on a Wednesday morning. So thank you everybody for attending. Hopefully you found this useful. Um, and I think Bianca is gonna send a feedback form after this. So please do fill that out. It's really helpful to us just to see areas where we can improve. And I'm always happy to receive feedback and also the YouTube link. I think she's also gonna send that over. So yeah, thank you everyone for attending and hopefully you found that helpful. Thank you, everyone. All right. How are you, Ruth? Oh, yes. No, well done. That was, uh, that was great. Yeah. If we had more time, I would have gotten a bit more into our markdown but i think everybody's tired yeah yeah it's also just like so much information 
like I don't know learning R is there's just so much to kind of pick up on so yeah yeah I feel like people's brains do um have a limit although it's good to split it across two days because if doing it all in one day I think I think yeah the afternoon would have been useless really yeah I agree yeah yeah no it's good and I guess people can but like, yeah I'm not done brilliant so I feel like people might want to address that that you know when they're a bit more familiar with R Yes, I think like if you can get your, your coding in order first and then you can use the R work down. That would be yeah. ideal. Yeah. I think maybe NHSR should do like a separate R markdown. I think they already I think they might have done that before, but just like a session around R markdown because you can really get into some more intermediate level stuff with yeah. it. Like yeah. But I think at the introductory level it's just like that simple HTML format, right? It's just yeah I mean it, even doing like really basic you know just having a powerpoint to make you know all of your graphs rather than having to copy and paste them that's a huge time saver so it is a good thing for people to be aware of yeah all right well I think we're the only ones here so nobody's safe for questions yeah good news because I'm really tired I'm really hungry <laughs> cool brilliant well nice to meet you yeah, nice to meet you too. Thank you for helping with the chat and everything. Oh, no worries. Cool. Okay, have a good afternoon. All right, you too. Bye. Bye.